After this song, we'll have our lesson. Let us sing. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about His healing, of His cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again And caused the blind to see And then I cried, dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit I then obeyed his blessed commands And gained the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing And the old redemption story And then sweet day I'll sing up there The song of victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. I loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Mark number 421 is a song of invitation. Love lifted me. Thank you, Jonathan. And we're certainly appreciative for any and all who are visiting with us this evening. It's my hope and my prayer that the presentation that is made will be received in the love by which the message will be delivered. Several years ago, I was in the town of Gray, Georgia. I was in a Walmart in Gray, Georgia, and some young people were going around the store and asking people if they could pray with them. And I was caught a little bit off guard because I'd never had anyone do that before, and so I didn't know these young people. I didn't know anything about their spiritual history or background or their church affiliation or anything like that. And so uh, I said, sure, why not? Um, Prayer is always a good thing, and I appreciate your zeal. And, and after they finished, I was just curious because there are different answers from different people 
to this question. I said, can you tell me what to do to become a Christian? There were two young men, as I recall, and, and they, they were taken aback by it almost as much as I was by them asking me about you know, having a prayer with them. And as I recall, they were not able to answer my question. And I thought to myself, I appreciate and love the zeal of these young people, but surely someone who would want to ask someone to have a prayer with them would know how to become a Christian in order to promote that kind of question. Now, if you ask that question of a lot of people today, would we not, most of us, agree that you get a little bit of a different answer from this person or that person as to who a Christian is. Some people say, well, everybody who believes in God is a Christian or, or different answers such as that. I think it's critical to recognize that the term Christian is indeed a biblical name. The term Christian is used three times and three times only in the New Testament. The first time it's noted is in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, where the Christians in Antioch of Syria, for the first time, were called Christians. That does not mean that the people who were disciples of Christ before that, from the time that the gospel began to be preached after the Lord went back to heaven, it doesn't mean that they were not Christians. It simply means that was the first time that the name Christian was used to apply to this new group of people who were followers of Christ. The second time that is used, that we find it used, first time is Acts 11:26. If you're taking any notes, the second time is in Acts chapter 26 and verse 28, where the apostle Paul was was preaching to Herod Agrippa about his life and about the gospel and, and Herod said in one particular translation in response to what Paul said in a short time you will persuade me to be a Christian and of course perhaps he was saying that in a sense that I need more time to think about this or do you really think that it's going to happen this fast or it could be, as I think the New International Version has Acts 26, 28, which says, do you think in a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? That is, it's put in a question form. So was he making a statement or was he posing a question? The original language is not that clear. But he does, obviously, the name Christian had come into vogue to the point that that's what God's people were being called. And Herod said, do you, do you think you're going to make me a Christian in this short period of time? And obviously, hopefully, it was a respectful response to, to Paul's question. But as far as at least New Testament history is concerned, Herod never became a Christian. The third instance is from the Apostle Peter himself in 1 Peter chapter 4 at verse 16. He's talking about Christians suffering. Early Christians suffered persecution for their faith. And in the, the New Testament is filled with that, especially the book of Acts. is filled with the persecutions that many of them endured. But Peter says, if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. There are those who believe that in Acts chapter 11, that verse 26, that the term was given in derision or as a form of mockery to make fun of these Christ followers or these people who belong to Christ. Uh, and even if it were, it was not given there, even if people used it that way, let me correct that, even if they used it that way, is that, the, is that the way that the name came about? Well, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 56, about verse 5, God's people would be given a new name. People had been called disciples before. People had been called saints before. And, and, and so the name Christian is the new, only new name that would be applied and it makes sense that it would be a new name because of Christ being relatively new 
in the world. He was crucified about age 30, and so his ministry did not last that long. He, he, was, uh, he was about 33, rather. He started his ministry about age 30, so he's only really well known as, a, as the Son of God and the teacher from heaven for about three years. Oh, but how that name caught fire. It indeed was a divine name. Peter would not have said, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him glorify God in this name if the name Christian were not divine in its origin. When you use I-A-N at the end of a word, it means to belong to someone. The Herodian, for example, was one who followed the ways and gave credence to gave credence to Herod. And there are other names that are used that would imply that these people followed someone in in their philosophy or in their ways, or maybe even as slaves of theirs. Now, it's interesting to think about names, isn't it? When I think about being a Christian, I don't want to be a Christian in any way unless the Bible tells me I'm a Christian. I don't want to be known as a person who follows the ways and the words or the teachings of human beings. These people are not divine in origin. They're not inspired to speak. Jesus was, and even Paul and Peter and other apostles were inspired to speak. But listen to Paul. Paul, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12, I want you to look at that with me for just a moment. It's a very interesting uh, situation where the church in Corinth had begun to divide. And they were dividing over human names or over people Perhaps, exactly the way it's given, they were following people who had baptized them. And so Paul says in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 1, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's household, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and another says, eye of Christ. Paul asked the question in 1 Corinthians 1.13, is Christ divided? Is Christ, and, and of course it's like, well, some might be Cephasites. Cephas was another name for the apostle Peter. Sometimes he was called Cephas, sometimes he was called Peter. And then there might be some who were Apollosites, that is, they adhered to Apollos. We should not adhere to a preacher just because he's up in a pulpit speaking. We should respect him as any other Christian. But certainly you don't follow them just because perhaps they baptized you. And that's what the Corinthians were doing. The potential for that was very bad, though. They could have divided. And Paul said, listen, um, others say, I have Cephas. And, I, and others say, well, I have Christ. It's that last one that they really should have been paying attention to. Paul was thankful that he didn't baptize any of them except for the household of Stephanus, according to verse 16. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. In other words, he did not make a big deal out of whether or not he personally baptized people. In verse 17, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would be made void. Paul was not speaking disparagingly or negatively about baptism. He was saying, Christ didn't send me out here to make a name of myself by baptizing people. And so I know one of the several years ago, the first time I went to the country of Panama was in 1984. And I remember Brother Bob Bryson was leading our mission team as we'd go out and teach people. And he said, we called ourselves gringos, and we, it was not a negative term. You know, we called them Panamanians, or uh, they called us the gringos, you know. He said, listen, you gringos, you let them baptize their own people lest they go and say one of these Americans baptized me. There would not have been anything wrong with us baptizing the Panamanians, 
But the purpose of the baptism was, or the relevance of it was not necessarily which person did it. And so what these brethren were doing in Corinth was so-and-so baptized me, so-and-so baptized me, and it caused division. Now those who were baptized in the name of Christ were doing it right. These people would have given honor to Jesus Christ as they should have. So we, we see then that the term Christian is divinely given, and it's a wonderful name to say that a person belongs to Christ. Matter of fact, Paul asked the question in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 1, Paul was not crucified for you, was he? The implication is, well, Jesus is the one who was crucified for you. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul if they'd been taught properly? And we'll come around to that in a little while. They would have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He had all authority. Now, we've looked at the name Christian. Now we want to look at a couple things about how not to identify a person who is a Christian. Most of us probably have heard that our country is a Christian nation. If you listen to people speak, do you really believe that the United States of America is a Christian nation? Well, we are a conglomeration of different beliefs, are we not? There are all kinds of people who, you, that there are Buddhists, there are people who have religion of Islam, there are others who are different of a different religious persuasion, and they would not claim to be Christians. As a matter of fact, they would be offended if they were called Christians. Those who are still Jewish and have not accepted Christ as the Messiah would be offended if you call them a Christian. Now, we're talking about people who are highly religious. But now, just because we have a lot of people in this country who are Christians, and we are citizens of it, of this nation, does not necessarily mean that we're born here doesn't make us Christians. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of people who would be upset if you said that to them, wouldn't they? They really would. But I think about the Christian nation, the church is referred to as, as the nation of God, a holy nation, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, and, and Christians are indeed a holy nation. But the United States of America is not. And somebody says, well, what about, what about our founding fathers? A lot of our founding fathers went to the Bible to make the laws of this country. And I'm thankful that they went to the Bible to make a lot of the laws for this country. That's a really good place to start. But some of those people were, were not Christians. They wouldn't claim to be. They were, some of them were Freemasons. Well, Freemasons did not claim to be Christians. They looked to one God or a divine being, and many of them saw that divine being as the God of the Bible, but they were not necessarily adherents of Jesus Christ. Now, some of them may have been, but that said, the nation had founding fathers who at least believed in God as we understand God. But you know among those people there would be different understandings about really who God is and what the Bible really is and who a Christian really is. So we're not necessarily Christians just because we're born as citizens of this country. Somebody says, well, a Christian is a moral person. Well, not necessarily, and there is an example for that in Acts chapter 10. There was a, a Gentile centurion, a commander of a hundred people in a Roman army by the name of Cornelius. And you read in verses 1 and 2 of Acts chapter 10, there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius. Now listen to the description of Cornelius. He was a... He was uh, a centurion of what is called the Italian cohort, and that was his job. And verse 2 says he was a devout man, one who feared God with all his household. Now, at that time, when you talk about a Gentile fearing God, they would have feared the God of the Hebrew people, the, the Jewish people. And many of the Jewish people had not yet become Christians, but he feared God, and yet, and it said also with his household, and he gave many alms to the Jewish people. That is, 
He was generous. He was benevolent in his works toward people who were in need. And the Bible says, and he prayed to God continually. Somebody says, well, that, that sounds like a Christian to me. Well, on the surface, I guess it could sound like a Christian. But it's interesting that when you keep on reading <clears throat> Acts chapter 10, you find that, that the apostle Peter had gone in verse 9 up on his rooftop to pray. Now, at this point, Peter was indeed a Christian. The church began in Acts chapter 2, and some 3,000 people were baptized that day. <clears throat> and Peter was an apostle who preached, one who had followed the Lord from the time of John the Baptist. Peter is a Christian. Peter is an apostle of Christ. But he was also Jewish. The Jewish people had no dealings with Samaritans. There's a long history to that. And the woman of Samaria in John 4 acknowledged that. Why would Jesus sit down at this well and ask her for a drink of water when Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? Because Jesus didn't see a Samaritan. He saw a woman who was in need of salvation. But it took Peter a little while to catch on to this. Matter of fact, he had not caught on to it yet. And you keep reading in verses 9 and following of Acts chapter 10 that the Lord showed Peter a vision. He went to sleep on the roof of a house and the Lord showed him a vision. <clears throat> and you see in verse, verse 11 that the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down lowered by four corners to the ground and there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. Now if you know anything about the Jewish uh, kosher of more modern word, list of foods, unclean animals were not on that list. The Old Testament forbade them of eating certain animals that Gentiles might eat, but not to Jews, they would be declared unclean. Well, the Lord has led all kinds of animals down in this sheet, in this vision, to Peter. And in uh, verse 13 says, A voice came to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Being the good Jew that he was when it came to what he would eat and not eat, said, by no means, Lord, I've never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Now, the Lord let that sheet down to Peter, not necessarily to say you can now eat a barbecue sandwich because the Jews would not eat pork. That was not necessarily his point. It could have been part of it, but his primary point was something and someone else. And God says in verse 15, the voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And of course, if you back up, we, we saw that Cornelius in verse 3 saw an angel in a vision. This Gentile commander, centurion, of a hundred Roman soldiers, who indeed was a Gentile, he had seen a vision by an angel, and the angel came and said to him in verse 3, Cornelius. And Cornelius fixed his gaze upon this angel, and he was much alarmed. And he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. God appreciates what you're doing here. He's not ignoring this. But now you dispatch some men to go to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, who is by the sea. And when the angel was speaking to him, he left. He summoned two of his servants and devout soldiers, those who were his personal attendants. And after he explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. And then it was after this, around this time, that Peter saw this vision. Well, ultimately, Cornelius and all his household are assembled together and Peter comes to the house. And, and he's going to preach to these people. Why is God sending Peter to preach to Cornelius? He's a devout man. He prayed to God always. He was a benevolent man. Surely he's okay with God. But you know, he wasn't. The, the Lord sent the Apostle Peter to preach to him. If you notice verses 34 and 35, 
Peter opens his mouth and he says, Most assuredly, I understand now that God shows no partiality. I want you to pause there for just a second. What partiality? That God at one time, he used the Jewish nation to bring Jesus into the world. It didn't mean he didn't love other peoples. He used them primarily for that purpose. He gave them the law as a tutor to bring them to Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24. And so Peter, as a Jewish person, is saying, now, now I understand that God shows no partiality. You know, when Christianity began, it started with the Jewish people in Acts chapter 2. But now the gospel is being spread to the Gentile people. And this man is a good man. In human explanations, he is. But he's not a Christian. Why would the Lord send Peter to him if he were a Christian? He says in verse 35, But in every nation he who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And so you, you turn over here to an, to, an, to an explanation where Peter is explaining to the, his Jewish counterparts, his Jewish friends, that um, God, God did something here. And I have to tell you about it. But one of the things that is noted that... Notice verses 13 and 14 of Acts 11 in Peter's explanation as you have Cornelius explaining also that he reported to us, Peter speaking of Cornelius, that he reported to us how he'd seen this angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. For Listen to verse 14 of Acts 11. For he will bring words to you by which you will be saved and all your household. Cornelius was a good man, but he wasn't saved. He wasn't a Christian. Peter, as an apostle, was sent to Cornelius' house. And he and his entire household heard the gospel. And you see in, in verses 47 and 48 of Acts 10 that no one can refuse water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on for a few days. What happened to Cornelius in his household? Well, they sent for Peter as an apostle to come and speak them words by which he and his household could be saved. Obviously, there was a lot more to the message than just them being baptized. They would have been explained, you know, you're, you're doing good by being benevolent, but you need Jesus. See, Jesus is the Son of God. He's the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He's the Son of God. He's God in the flesh. And ultimately, the Jewish people put Him to death, but God raised Him up the third day. And he's the only name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. And so Peter would have preached to him. And then, of course, at the end of these words, he and his household were, were all baptized in order to become Christians. So being a moral person, I've known some atheists who we would probably call good people. They... They don't bother anybody. They're honest. But certainly they would not claim to be Christians. In order to be a Christian, one must attach himself or herself to Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Well, so then just a good moral person. Well, what about a theist? What is a theist? A theist is one who believes in God. Cornelius was that, but there are a lot of people who, who believe in God. And, and, of course, the Jewish people during the early period of Christian history in the New Testament believed in God. And yet, many of them did not obey the gospel. They did not become Christians. There are a lot of people in our age who believe in God. If you ask them who God is, I dare say there's a lot of confusion about who God is. But many people believe in God. But does that mean one is a Christian? You know, in James chapter 2 and verse 19, he says, You believe that God is one. You do well. But the latter part of the verse says, Why, the demons believe and they tremble. Demons 
were spirits that obviously were let loose for a little time in the first century in order for Christ to show his power over them. There's no demon possession today. Now, demons still exist, but they're, they're not active now. They were at one time. But the point of, that James was making was, let me ask you, does the devil believe in God? While you read the book of Job, he had a conversation with him. Did the devil confront Jesus in Matthew 4 when he was in temptation in the wilderness? Did he believe in God? Now, to believe in God and to put one's trust in God are two entirely different things. Why do the demons tremble? Obviously, their faith is not the kind of faith that a person needs. And he's applying, James applies this to Christians who, well, they say you have, work, have faith, but you don't do any works for the Lord. And that was his primary point. But then, thinking about this, the Jews in Jesus' day believed in God. Matter of fact, they put Jesus to death because he claimed to be God. We know from the reading of Scripture that he was God, and yet they did not believe that. They accused him of blasphemy, and they put him to death for it and felt justified in doing it. But now, Jesus declared something about himself that declared his deity. One of those statements is in Luke chapter 10 at verse 16. Jesus said, He who rejects me rejects him who sent me. When Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, first of all, it was a statement of a declaration of deity. He was a part of the Godhead. You have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as God. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins in John 8, 24. The Jews took that to be a declaration of deity. And that's part of the reason they killed him. But in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, in order for these Jewish people in the first century to become Christians, they had to accept Christ as the Son of God. Jesus made it clear, I am the way. And Jesus said in John 8, 24 again, unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Isaiah other Old Testament prophets had prophesied of a Messiah who would come. And I, in uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the virgin would be with child and bring forth a son. And then you come to Matthew chapter 1, and verse 21, and the virgin will be with child. You call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In verse 23, the name of Jesus means Emmanuel or God with us. If the Jewish people would accept Jesus as the Son of God, they could become Christians. Let me ask you, who is Jesus to you? Is he just somebody you think about every now and then? Somebody you have great respect for and you believe he died on Calvary's cross for your sins? You know, that's good. But have you accepted him as your Lord and Master? And Jesus, when he said, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. Listen to what he says to the Jews in John chapter 8. Many of the Jewish people believed in Jesus. But there, there's, a, there's a next level for this faith or this belief. Jesus was saying to them in John 8, 31, to those Jews who had believed him, who? Those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. It was not enough just to believe in him or what he had to say. And Jesus went on to say in verse 32 of John 8, And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And in verse 36, he says, And if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. How did Jesus make it possible for people to be free from sin? 
In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul wrote, Christ died for our sins. Jesus says the Son will make you free. Make you free, make you free indeed. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says He has loosed us from our sins in His own blood. It's the blood of Jesus that makes it possible for individuals to be made free. But Jesus said it's made known by the truth. Let me ask you a question. Where is that truth? Is it in the opinions of men? Is it in the opinions of some of our own relatives? Is it in the opinion even of some preacher? Or does it come from a different source? Jesus would say in John chapter 17 and verse 17, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. When we pick up our Bibles, particularly the New Testament portion of it, we have the truth of God given for Christians. Jesus said the truth will make you free. That implies then that I need to get to know this book. I need to understand what truth is. So simply because one believes in God does not necessarily mean that they are a Christian. But what about somebody who, is, who claims to be a Christian by faith only? I want you to think about something that was said in Hebrews 5 verse 9. That Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey Him. Now, it's interesting that that statement, Hebrews 5, 9, again, is in the letter to the Hebrews. And the most outstanding chapter in Hebrews is the 11th chapter. And by faith, everybody who's listed there has, by faith, did something in response to that faith. It was not simply a mental assent. Well, somebody says, well, I believe in God. I'm going to heaven. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And, and because I believe that and I confess that, I'm going to heaven. Isn't it amazing how a lot of people say that, but by the way that they live, they really don't believe that the ways that Jesus taught are the way people ought to live? Isn't there quite often this contradiction in their lifestyle and what the New Testament teaches about Christian behavior? When Jesus would say in John 8 and verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. There is a pattern of truth that Jesus taught that we must follow to live a holy life, and a moral life apart from the world. And it's not simply, simply by having faith. I know there are a lot of people that believe in faith only, but I cannot find that practice in the New Testament. Listen to Jesus again in John chapter 12, verses 42 to 43. I want to hit the pause button here for just a second. If we want to answer this question, where do we go? We go to the New Testament. That's the only way we can get the answers to these question, questions and be consistent in those answers. Now, we see in John 12, verses 42 and 43, Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in Him. These were rulers of the Jews who believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing Him. That confession would have been, He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. We really believe that. But you know, they wouldn't confess that. But their, So their level of belief was not where it needed to be, was it? If they would not confess Him as Christ, there are a lot of people that believe in God and believe in Christ, but their level of belief will not bring them to confess Him or live as Christian people. It will not bring them to the point that they would respond to the teachings of Jesus. And so to believe in God in mental assent or faith only is not, is not biblical. In Romans uh, chapter 1, 10 rather, I'm sorry. In Romans chapter 10 beginning with verse 1, the Apostle Paul was speaking of his Jewish brethren. That is, 
as far as he was a Jew, they were Jew. He's not brethren in a spiritual sense, but by a national sense. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Paul, what's wrong with some of your Jewish people that you know? He says, well, I testify about them that they have a zeal for God. These were people that Paul said were zealous for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Knowledge and truth need to be coupled with our zeal, our excitement. And you know why some people become Christians and don't stay Christians for very long? They're zealous, but they don't lock into truth and get the knowledge they need to be faithful. He says they know about God's righteousness and seeking to, watch this, and seeking to establish their own. They do not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. They had a zeal for God, but it was not according to knowledge, and they established their own righteousness. We ask the question, where is righteousness found? Paul would say in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In Romans 1, 17, Paul says, For therein the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The righteousness of God is found in the gospel. The gospel is a New Testament record of the life of Christ, how to become a Christian, and how to live as one. So we look at these things. Well, what about, somebody says, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian because I go to church. I know a lot of people who are members of churches. And then you ask them some questions about their convictions. There are a lot of people who are a member of certain churches who flat deny the deity of Christ. But there are churches. They say, well, no, Jesus was a good man, but he was not God. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. He claimed to be deity. And there are others who have established their churches based upon what they think the church ought to be, but they've not gone to the New Testament to see what the church ought to be. Let me ask you a question. If I want to know how I'm supposed to be a Christian and how the church is supposed to be, is not the New Testament the place to go? A place that gives me a consistent, solid source of information. There is so much confusion. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, the Bible says God is not the God of confusion, but of peace. He doesn't want us to be confused. So we look at the New Testament, we can get clearly what we ought to be and not simply be church members. But what about baptized people? Well, that's an interesting thing to consider. There are, if you ask one person, for example, you look up in the dictionary what baptism is. Baptism may say, well, it's a, it's a rite of sprinkling or pouring, or it could be immersion. Now, that is a human definition of a biblical word. The biblical word to baptize literally means to put under or to immerse. And so... So we know that the mode of baptism, just by definition of the word, check any good source of New Testament words that you will, and you'll find that they'll all say, not, not Webster's or some other dictionary, but a good dictionary of the New Testament, that it means immersion. John the Baptist should have been called John the Immerser, if you want to identify that word, uh, identify him in that way. But some people have been sprinkled. Some were done so as little babies. Now hold those thoughts. And some by effusion or by pouring water over someone's head. Let me ask you a question. When you were in school, if you were in, in uh, say you were in a biology class or some science class, and you had a very clear definition about what something was, and you gave the wrong answer, would your teacher not put a red circle around that and make, take so many points off? Because that's not what that means, Roger. That's not what that word means. If we want to know what a word means, we go to the sources. 
You know, originally, many years ago, everyone who baptized for any reason did so in the form of immersion because they understood that was what it meant. But also, it's possible for a person even to be immersed and not be immersed properly. Somebody says, well, how, how would you know that? In Acts chapter 19, the Apostle Paul goes to the city of Ephesus. The church is fairly young. Christianity is still fairly young. And we see that Paulus in verse 1 of Acts 19 was at Corinth. Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus. Ephesus was the capital city of Asia, Asia Minor. It was the largest city of that part of the world. And that's where he comes. And when he gets there, he finds some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we've not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. I want to hit the pause button briefly. In the first century, the, the Holy Spirit uh, baptized the apostles in Acts 2. They could lay their hands on others. They would receive the Holy Spirit. It was needed in the first century for knowledge. They didn't have the New Testament yet. They couldn't run down to the local Bible bookstore and get a copy of the Bible. They, but, so they had the Holy Spirit to enable them to have supernatural knowledge. Once the New Testament was finished, that was no longer needed, but it was then. And so men, they would receive help from the Holy Spirit in understanding God's will so they could live as Christians. Well, here's some disciples. And they're called disciples. But Paul says, well, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you baptized? Obviously, he picked up on something that led, them, led him to believe that they had not. And so he asked the question in verse 3 of Acts 19, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Now, Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. Obviously, that was still being taught by some. John had since died. Christianity had begun, and when Christianity began, early Christians had help from the Holy Spirit in this special way. And so obviously, you back up to chapter 18, you find a man by the name of Apollos who was still teaching John's baptism. And, and two precious people took him aside and taught him the way of the Lord more accurately. What's the point? A person can be baptized, but be baptized incorrectly. And when they heard what Paul said, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Jesus is getting ready to go back to heaven. We see that in verse 16 that the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus has designated. And, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. Well, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He's speaking to the apostles. These men that he trained for some three years to go out and preach after he went back to heaven. But he says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's Matthew 28, 16 through 20. It's interesting when you look at this. I am confused. Somebody says, well, that's nothing new, Roger, for you to be confused. But I'm a little confused. When people stand up to preach to others who... They are trying to get to obey the gospel. I find it curious is that very often, more, seldom if ever, will they mention the importance of the need for baptism. I ask you a question. When Jesus gave this commission, he said, I want you to go make disciples. And what, what do you want us to do with those disciples, Jesus? These apostles might ask. I want you to baptize them. In the name of or by the authority of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you find something similar in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. 
These are words from Jesus just before he went back to heaven. Some of his last words. He says, I want you to go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That gospel was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I want you to preach that. And notice in verse 16 of Mark 16, the Lord said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. I have to ask the question, who is a Christian? Well, obviously a person is a Christian who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. A person, as you turn over to Acts chapter 2, who, who would, repent, would repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins at the command of Jesus. You notice he said, I want you to go and baptize these people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, I have all authority. So when you read in Acts, they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It was just a short way of saying the same thing because he had all authority. And so in Acts chapter 2, the church is established. These people have been convinced that they have killed Jesus. Can you imagine how you would feel if you had been there just a few days before crying out or hollering out with others, crucify him, put him to death, crucify him. Can you imagine being there and then hearing Peter's sermon in Acts 2 and realizing you were dead wrong? This was the Son of God that you killed. And God is exalted. He's raised Him to His right hand. You were, can you imagine? If you had a good heart, you'd feel like they did. In Acts 2, verse 37, the Bible says, They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, an inspired man on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 said the following, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question. People in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, were first called Christians in Antioch. What about these people in Acts 2? Were they Christians? Yes, they were. They'd been made disciples. They were baptized for the command of Jesus. But notice that there was a purpose in it. It's for the remission of sins. Somebody says, well, how do you know that doesn't mean because of the remission of sins? Well, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, a man by the name of Ananias speaks to Saul of Tarsus. He'd been praying for three days, and Ananias had been sent by God to preach to Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle, he asked him the question in Acts 22 and verse 16, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Simple illustration. When I was a little boy, my mama taught me to wash away the dirt from my hands before I came to the kitchen table. She didn't tell me to come to the kitchen, go to, go to the sink and and wash my hands because the dirt was already taken away, go in there in order to take away the dirt. It's a really simple illustration. Now, fortunately, Saul responded to that. He became a Christian. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, we learned that the early church, they, they had favor with all the people. In the latter part of the verse says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. If you back up to verse 41, about 3,000 people responded that day to Peter's preaching. Who were these people? They were Christians. How did they become Christians? Because they heard the truth that set them free. And if you notice today in this presentation this afternoon, I, everything I've given you has come from the Word of God. That's my only source. I don't have all authority. No preacher has all authority. No elder in the church has all authority. Our authority now is Scripture given to us by God. So I appeal to you to think on these things, to study them. If you have questions, let one of us know.
I want to do things God's way. And I know where the answers are. Who is a Christian? One who's heard the gospel, has believed it, has confessed Christ as the Son of God, has repented of his or her sins, and has been baptized for the remission of sins. That makes a Christian. And throughout the book of Acts, they all did the same thing in order to become Christians. Think on these things. If you have any questions, please come to us. If you want anything further to study to help you, we'll supply that for your benefit. If you have a need right now to respond to the Lord's invitation, He's the one who asks, not me. I'm just a human being in flesh speaking a message from God that I hope can help you. If you need to respond, please do so as we stand and as we sing.